Okay, let's continue. We're now back in Revelations chapter 1. We're going to look at the remainder part of the chapter because this chapter is all about Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. So we read in verse 7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds. And this all caps, this is the translation. I did not do this. And every eye will see him, even those who pierce him. And all the tribes of the earth, or better translated, all the tribes of Israel, will mourn over him. So it is to be a man. And we read in verse 12, where uh, Jesus is introduced, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. Well, we just read about that in Daniel, right? Well, guess what? This is Jesus' preferred title for himself. Son of man, the cloud rider, uh, which we read all about in Daniel. Dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. And then later on, starting in verse 14, the hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. His voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. Coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword, the word of God. His face was like the sun shining in all of his brilliance. So it's like, who is this Jesus? This is the Jesus in all of his glory, or at least a good portion of his glory. And then in verse 17, he placed his right hand on me, being John, and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And then he says this, I hold the keys of death and Hades. Wow. Jesus is speaking about his absolute control and power with the destiny of angels and principalities and rulers and authorities and all of mankind. And this power and authority is absolute and is reserved only for Almighty God. Jesus Christ is all mighty God. He may be 100% human through the incarnation, but he is 100% God. So who is this Jesus Christ? And we went through uh, quite a, a bit of um, background on this, which uh, if you have not uh, seen that, uh, that class session, I highly recommend it. But let me just say this. Who is Jesus Christ? Hebrews chapter 1 says, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word and he had provided purification for sins his first coming after he provided purification for his sins he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven where he is today first corinthians 8 6 kind of explains the father and the son very succinctly there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, God the Father. There is one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. Very, very important. And then from there, we, we went into chapters 2 and 3, which was Jesus' personal message to seven churches in Asia Minor. But ultimately, this was um, personal messages to all churches, to the universal church, through the church throughout time. And in this, uh, uh, these seven letters, uh, there was a pattern, and it all started out to the angel, singular, of the church end. So, uh, probably the one that was responsible for the church. And then he says, I know your deeds. And then he explains, and then he says, whoever has ears, let them hear. So he's speaking to the angel singular, the, the leader of the church, but then he says, whoever has ears, everybody, listen up. Not just the leader of the church, 
everybody that calls themselves members of God, of Jesus. Let them hear what the Spirit says to the church, to the ecclesiastes, to the ecclesia, the, the gathering. And this is given verbatim to all seven churches. And then he'll say, once again, he takes it into a singular mode, to the one who is victorious, he who overcomes, he who wins the victory, the one who conquers. It all depends on the translations. Uh, but anyway, he gives this word of encouragement or in anything else. But out of all this, he tells us that deeds are important. Deeds uh, corporately as a church, deeds individually to God. Does it, have anything, does it have anything to do with our salvation? Of course not. It doesn't. But it has everything to do with um, judgment and rewards in the future. Fusions, uh, uh, let me just read two passages here. 2 Corinthians 5. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done, our deeds, while in the body, whether good or bad. Ephesians 2.10, we are God's handiwork. We're created in Christ Jesus. Remember, that's how we uh, exist, as we read earlier. To do what? Good works. Deeds, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So, that's one reason why he says to the one who's victorious, to the, he who overcomes. This is so important, uh, a, a key message. Uh, even to the two churches that there was absolutely no rebu rebukes, it was still the same message. So what is that key takeaway in all this? Well, what matters is how we live our life in relationship to the events around us, the pressures that we face every day. Obviously, we're living in various serious times, economically, socially. There's so many pressures. There's so many moral challenges. And every event, every pressure, every temptation is a crossroad where we either become an overcomer or we are overcome, which leads to defend, to, to, to a defeat. So if we do not become overcomers in the little things in life, this is the message. Bigger things are coming. How will we ever stand a chance in the tribulations that the future holds? That's the reason why uh, uh, the key message is to him who perseveres, to him who endures. So very, very important. So uh, in summary of all these uh, seven letters, noteworthy praises were what? Uh, you've kept my word. You have not denied my name. You've kept my command to endure patiently. You cannot tolerate e wicked people. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans. You test those who are uh, claimed to be apostles. And you're now doing more than you did at first. Your deeds are, your good deeds are just building and building and building. You're kingdom builders. Uh, through Christ, obviously. Noteworthy rebukes to the seven churches, which means also to the church today, you tolerate, you tolerate, that's a key word here, you tolerate sin that infiltrates into the, the church, uh, be it actual sin, be it political correctness, uh, be it whatever. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. You t uh, there are some among you that hold to the teaching of Balaam or to the Nicolaitans. You need to strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished. And then we have those that are arrogant. You say, I am rich, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Very, very important words, and, and all the, the, these letters to the church have a an apocalyptic uh, uh, message behind them as well. So, and in conclusion to chapters 2 and 3, deeds are a main subject of these letters. They are important. Confronting worldly teachings and ways and political correctness that is found within the church today, unfortunately, is important. Wrong association with bad people. Wrong doctrines is important. Proper church leadership 
is so vitally important. We should not take church leadership lightly. We should not take church government lightly because this is important. We need to live in the present for God. We don't need to rely on what's happened in our church or in our life in the past, but we need to be forward-looking and uh, forward reaching out to God. We need to love the Lord. We need to love one another, the two greatest commandments. We need to minister to each other. That's important and lifting each other up in the Lord. We need to run the race all the way to the end. We need to persevere. We need to endure. Never give up, even if weary. And that is chapters two and three. And then moving on to chapters four and five, which are just so revealing. John is taken up into the throne room of God, where it says in 4.2, at once I was in the spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven. He couldn't even describe the, the God. He just says, there was somebody sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Ruby, and there's a rainbow that shone like an emerald and circled the throne. John is trying to describe the indescribable. Okay, and, and then he goes on. He says, well, surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. Let's call them elders. And they were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. And so we're introduced to the 24 elders. And uh, the things that the Bible has disclosed, well, they're always in the throne room. They're always associated with... Uh, Four living creatures, which we'll get to next. They're involved with worshiping God in heaven. They're always distinguished from the saints. There's no interchanging there. They are involved with God's purpose on earth, and they seem to always know what is happening. So they are part of the mission and the plan. Uh, they're part of the, shall we say, the, the, the spear point of what's going forward in God's plan and the Lamb's plan. <clears throat> and also, uh, in chapter 4, in front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. And then we're told, these are the seven spirits of God. Seven spirits of God? What are we talking about here? Well, this is the Holy Spirit. Remember, we did not go in this session, but when we did chapter 1, we went all through this because from the seven spirits before his throne was part of chapter 1, verse 4. Well, what are these seven spirits before the throne? Well, the easy way, easiest way to compare this is remember, God instructed Moses to build a tabernacle with exact instructions because this is going to represent what's going on and what's seen in the actual throne room, which John is now seeing, right? So this biblical comparison and analogy, uh, when we get to the seven spirits, we have to look at the menorah, the lamp span. And it was where? It was inside the tabernacle before his throne. How was it built? Well, there was a ton of detail of how to build this because as is explained in Hebrews, this is a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. So the menorah comprised of what? seven individual lamps with oil. Each one then was on their own separate branch. So there was seven lamps, seven branches. Uh, we're being told here there is seven spirits of God, and you would go to the original language. It does not say sevenfold, as some commentators will try to, to uh, convince you. It says seven spirits. Well, like there's seven lamps on seven branches, there's what? One light. Just like there's seven spirits, yet there's only one Holy Spirit. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. And if you expect to understand all this, then you don't fully understand the mystery of God. And then, also, in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass. What looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal, and that is important. And it's a sea, it's huge, it's monstrous, and it's like a clear glass floor between God's throne. And one way of looking at this is it could be, it doesn't explain, but it could be a barrier between the throne room and the rest of the heavenlies 
and the earth. So it's almost like a barrier keeping evil out from the presence of God in the throne room. Uh, and then in the center around the throne were what? There were four living creatures. And they were all different, but they were all covered with eyes in front and back. And the first one was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third like a man, the fourth like a flying eagle. And each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. So one thing we can take away from all this, there's four of them, but they're all individuals as well. Uh, we would call these the seraphim. But day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So these mighty, magnificent beings uh, that man would be very tempted to worship, what are they doing? They're worshiping God day and night. Holy, 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 because God transcends all holiness. I used to think that holy, holy, holy was, well, holy for God the Father, holy for God the Son, holy for God the Holy Spirit. But no, that's not the case. This is the construct of Hebrew and Greek language, is that when you mention the word once, okay, that's face value. You mention it twice, that's like uh, doing bold italics and underline. You mention it three times, and it is so beyond what I'm trying to communicate. And that's what's being communicated here. God is so holy. He transcends everything. Where holiness, as we understand it, is set apart for God. How do we put God as holy? He is set apart of, above all and everything. He transcends everyone and everything. So that's chapter 4. Now we go to chapter 5, the scroll and the Lamb. Chapter 5, what happens here is, the, is that um, um, the story continues, but now we're seeing something extremely formal, extremely orchestrated, like, a, like an orchestrated coronation. And when, when we start to see what's happening, it's, what we're seeing is what's being happening, what is happening before John's eyes is fulfillment of like Genesis 49, uh, the prophecy to Judah, uh, Psalms um, uh, 2, where God says, I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. So call this a coronation. But one thing to keep in mind is that while Scripture attributes supreme authority and sovereignty to God the Father, Yahweh, it's clear that His purpose Yahweh's purpose is that Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, will rule the world. So, we read the first five verses where there's a mighty angel proclaiming a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? Okay, you know that was scripted. But no one in heaven or earth or under earth could open it. And then we found out later that uh, one of the 24 elders in the know, he goes, uh, John, don't weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Okay, what is all that? That's the seed of the woman has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and his seven seals. And so John looks to see the lion from the tribe of Judah, someone like what we just saw earlier in, in uh, Revelations chapter 1, and all this blazing glory, and what does he see? Then I saw a lamb, looking at it as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the 24 elders and the lamb had seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth and he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne now while we unpack this at, a, at an earlier session let me just say this here what we're seeing here is so fundamental so important God, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, he is conquering not by force, at least now in the early stages of the game, but
but he is conquering by death, by his own death, by a horrendous death, not by violence, which he's fully capable of, but by martyrdom. The message here is that the lion is a lamb. And he is the message that he is trying to give us is that we as followers, uh, and there's so much more that we're going to discuss in this, but for now, we as followers, we need to what? We need to follow his example. We need to take up our cross and follow him. And as it will say uh, later in Revelation, love our lives, not unto death. So anyway, he, Jesus, the, the lion, the lamb, went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. What's the scroll? We went through some possibilities to the first century uh, uh, audience. They would probably go, oh, well, it has all the markings of a last will and testament or a title deed. And there's some wonderful applications there. Or maybe it's just God's master plan to take and restore his kingdom. Uh, and, and of course, that's, that's really unpacked in our earlier session. Then we read in verse 11, uh, I, then I looked, John looked in the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And were they doing what they did in the past? Worshipping him who sit on the throne? No. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. All the heavenlies are now worshipping the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Guess what? Yahweh is to be worshipped. Yeshua is to be worshipped. Yahweh is God. Yeshua is God. They're all one the same. They're still individuals. Don't get me wrong. Um, and that was very clearly spelled out earlier. But Jesus Christ is divine. Just like God the Father, the Ancient of Days, is divine. Very, very important. And also what's important of all this, it, it shows us how to worship our Lord, our God, our Savior. But then we got another transition. Verse 13, Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne, now we're back focused on the Father, and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Wow. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, let's ask him what his teaching is on the end times. And so we're going to very quickly go through his teaching, the Olivet Discourse, uh, where disciples came up to Jesus and said, and, and this is after all that had happened during the day, and Jesus telling them that the temple was going to be destroyed. He says, Master, tell us when these things will be. And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So three specific questions, and Jesus gives specific answers to each and every one of them. But before we go there, we have to introduce ourselves to another word. <coughs> coming. Coming is like what? Uh, a verb. Well, it's not. The Greek word is parousia, and it is a noun. Uh, and, of course, if the translator is trying to pick one word, they'll translate it as coming, but it's a noun. It means an arrival and a continuing presence with all sorts of things going on. It's the Greek word behind the second coming, but it's so much more. It's Jesus' arrival on the clouds, the resurrection of the dead, the rapture of those that are still alive on this arrival, the day of the Lord's wrath, bringing in the remnant of Israel to salvation, establishing his earthly rule, judgment and rewards, the wedding, the wedding feast, the, 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 the Passover that's going to be shared with his people. That's the parousia. So 
Now, if we start to put that in context, uh, tell us when these things will be, what will be the sign of your parousia. Jesus said, first and foremost, what? See, no one leads you astray. Many are going to come in my name. Uh, they're going to say, I am the Messiah, and they will lead many astray. And we're going to find out later that there is one particular teaching of an expected Messiah called the Mahdi. Uh, and you will hear of wars and rumor of wars, and see, don't be alarmed. And the nation will rise against nation. This is very important because in the Greek, it doesn't say that. In the Greek, it says ethnos will come against ethnos. These are ethnic groups against ethnic groups, like Christians uh, and Jews and, um, and uh, Islamic uh, uh, powers. Those are ethnos. And kingdom against kingdom, yeah, that's the countries. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And it's like, wow, this is terrible. What does Jesus say? These are just the beginning of birth pains. Oh, my goodness. Then they will deliver you up into what? Tribulation. That's going to be the great tribulation. Then they will deliver you up into tribulation. So this is the wrath of Satan because they is the Antichrist and his armies. The wrath of Satan and they will put you to death and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. So this is specifically addressed to what? Christians for my main state then many are going to fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Why is that? Because they're not persevering. They're not enduring. Their faith is shallow. Uh, and uh, they are wishy-washy in their beliefs and in their faith. This is the refining process of the church, the refining process of the Jewish people as well. And then what? Many false prophets are going to arise. They're going to leave many as astray. Uh, and there's going to be lawlessness. That's going to be increased, which we're seeing today. And the love of many is going to grow cold, which we see today. But then he very importantly says what? The one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of what? Of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And he goes on to say, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, the holy place of the temple, there's going to be another temple, let the reader understand. Because if you study Daniel, you'll understand. You'll know what's going on. And then he says, flee. If you're in Jerusalem, Judea, flee to the mountains. Um, and don't delay. Run. Because then there will be great tribulation, such as not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, it never will be. And so this abomination of desolation, we're going to go into Daniel, but that's in the middle of the 77th. That starts, kicks off the great tribulation. Before that, tribulation, birth pains. Let's read on, because then he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give his light, stars will fall from heaven, the powers of heavens will be shaken, and then, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes on the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then what happens? He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, very important, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to other. What is that? That's the resurrection of the dead. That's the rapture of the saints. And uh, it's like, okay, well, when does that happen? Because I thought the rapture could happen any second now, or at least that's what so many people say or churches say. No. Sorry, beloved. This is verse 31. 31 does not happen until verse 29 happens, which is after the tribulation. Verse 29, verse 30 doesn't happen, uh, or 30, 31 doesn't happen until verse 30 happens, which is what? During or after when everyone sees the Son of Man 
coming from heaven, the cloud rider with power and great glory. So um, there's a couple of verses from Paul, a scripture from Paul that helps explain this, where he says, now the coming concerning the coming, the parousia, remember, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So his coming, his second coming, and our being gathered together with him, the rapture and the resurrection, let no one deceive you in any way. For that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, unless the man of lawlessness is revealed, that being the Antichrist, the son of destruction, who opposes, exalts himself against every so-called God and object of worship, so that what? He takes his seat in the temple of God, the third temple in Jerusalem, proclaiming himself to be God. For the mystery of lawlessness was already underway, it's already at work, and only he who now restrains it will do so until what? He's out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Then we'll see the abomination of desolation, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his parousia, his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the, is by the activity of Satan, and what? With all power and false signs and wonders. Remember what Jesus says. See to it that no one deceives you. Paul goes also explains in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left, until the coming, the parousia of the Lord, guess what? We're not going to go ahead of those who have fallen asleep. We'll not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself is what? He's going to descend from heaven. We read about that in Matthew 24. With the cry of a command, we read about that. The voice of an archangel. With the sound of the trumpet, we read that. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will what? We'll be caught up together with the dead of Christ. That's the rapture. With them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. That's the rapture. And then we very quickly, uh, we looked at Zechariah. And, and just we'll skim over some of it. But Zechariah is so important. This concerns the day of the Lord, the new covenant, Jacob's trouble, um, Armageddon. It's all there. Zechariah 12, verse 1. The oracle from the Lord concerning Israel. Oh, Israel, his chosen people. His most treasured possession, right? Thus declares Yahweh, who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. Behold, what? I'm about to make Israel a cup of staggering to all the surrounding peoples. The siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. So this is not just Jerusalem. This is all of Israel on that day. What's that day? That's the parousia. That's the second coming of the Lord. I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all peoples. All who lift it will surely hurt themselves. So, and all the nations on the earth will gather against it. Why? Because the Lord is going to make that happen, which we'll read about in Ezekiel. On that day, declares the Lord, I will strike every horse with panic, its rider with madness. Um, and uh, then the clans of Judah shall say to themselves, the inhabitants of Jerusalem have strength through what? Yahweh of hosts, their God. And then in verse 10, Yahweh says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, on him whom they pierce. Wait a minute. This is Yahweh speaking, right? But then he's saying, when they look on me, on whom they have peers? That's Yeshua. That's Jesus Christ. That's the Messiah. They shall mourn for him 
as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Why? Because they will recognize finally after hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, Yeshua is, was, and is the Messiah. And they will mourn. They will weep bitterly. And on that day, the mourning in Jerusalem will be, will be great. Chapter 13, verse 1, On that day there shall be a fountain, though, open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jude, Jerusalem to what? To cleanse them from sin and uncleanliness. Just like the McVeigh in the wedding ceremony. However, then, Zechariah goes back into a little history, and he says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. Who's my shepherd? The Messiah. Against the man who stands next to me declares Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, okay, that's Jesus Christ sitting on the seat on the right hand uh, where he is today. Uh, and, but historically, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. We saw that happen. I will turn my hand against my own people, the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off, two-thirds shall perish. This is Jacob's trouble, which we will get into. Only one third shall be left alive. And that third, I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refines silver and test them as gold is tested. Then, then they will call upon my name. I will answer them. Then I will say, and we've heard this before, they are my people. And they will say, Yahweh is my God. Chapter 14 starts concluding things. A day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in the midst. I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. That's the battle of Armageddon. And the city shall be taken and the houses plundered and the women raped. So it's going to be a terrible day for everybody. Um, Half the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on the day of battle. On that day, and listen to this, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mountain goes north, the other southward, and you shall flee to the valley of my mountains. For the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azul. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. So there will be a fleeing to a place in the wilderness prepared by God that we'll read about in Revelation 13. And then let me just add one more uh, Old Testament passage, which is part of the end, which is really the beginning. Isaiah 66, 22, For as the new heavens and the new earth that I make shall remain before me, says the Lord Yahweh, so that your offspring and your name remain from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. And this is during the millennium. Verse 24, And they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me, for their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be in abhorrence. To all flesh. So, the moral of this story is set our Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and become a citizen of Israel, a recipient of God's covenants. Um, and there's so much more to go. So, this is just halfway during our review, and there'll be another whole session. Uh, for, for the rest of that. So until then, amen and amen and be blessed.